All right, so let's go ahead and dive in in week one. And I want to introduce a few concepts here that um, build upon the text, sort of repeat it, sort of enhance it, um, to make sure that we really introduce this idea of strategic communication that we're talking about um, with a kind of common framework and common lens. And it turns out that there's a couple of different ways for us to look at strategic communication. And this idea gets introduced in the first couple of chapters. So, so I want to explain this a little bit. Um, we can think of of organizations as you know sort of in this top down sense as consisting of structures and systems and processes that in essence are the the, the container the place where people work organizations have policies that dictate people's behavior they have structures that determine job descriptions and roles that tell people uh, the kinds of things that you ought to do on a day-to-day -day basis but we can have this opposite sort of perspective too because none of those things actually got built or existed without us, without people, without interaction, without communication, without people participating. Somebody wrote the policy. Somebody created the job descriptions. So there's this sense that communication and interaction built that same organization that then dictated how people within it should interact. So that idea, hopefully, you see reflected in the first couple of chapters here. And so we'll, we'll kind of look at two different ways, again, that this translates into organizational theory and how people have approached um, looking at and examining organizations and how we work within them. And I want to take this, this these are philosophical concepts, theoretical concepts in, in part as a whole, um, but I want to translate it into why should I care as a manager? What difference does it make? So I want to look at these two, two ideas of systems theory, which you read about in the text, and social construction theory, which you didn't exactly, we didn't call it that to begin with. But these are, in essence, reflective of that, those two ideas, the kind of container view of the top-down organization where structures dictate behavior, and the bottom-up communication creates all of that to begin with. So I hope you see that thread um, trace throughout these following slides. Systems theory and social construction, fundamentally at their core, reflect different assumptions about how organizations work, how they change, and how we should think about them. Systems theory examines relationships between components of organization. I'm going to talk about what those components are in a second. And social construction theory approaches um, th those construction, social construction approaches question those components as outcomes of our own language and meaning. This is that communication perspective. Let's dive in first to systems theory models of organization. So the idea of systems theory goes back to a series of writings by an Austrian biologist in about the 1940s, uh, Ludwig von Bertlanffy, who wrote a series of books and articles in about that time about the systemic interconnection of the natural world and what he was pointing out in in a very kind of natural biological sense is that the 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 um, nature exists uh, in in all living organisms living organisms exist in in a kind of symbiotic relationship with their environment right which makes a lot of sense to us you see a fruit tree and there's a drought and it can't then produce fruit because it doesn't have water, it doesn't have enough sunshine or air, right? We know these sort of intuitive things about the natural environment. Well, it turns out, according to um, Daniel Katz and Richard Kahn in a 1966 book called The Social Psychology of Organizations, that um, organizing is like that too. That human systems actually work like that. So they argued that all social systems, including organizations, consist of the patterned activity of a number of individuals. So they said, look, organizations are like those same kind of open systems where there are inputs like water and air, like a tree. There's a transformative process. There are outputs. There's a feedback mechanism. And all this exists in concert with an organization's environment. And if we think about it like... Um, a, a manufacturing plant for an automobile, for example, you'll think of those, uh, we can imagine inputs like the people, the raw materials, the, the machinery, the um, car doors and, and 
you know, plastic components and tires and things like that, right? All of those are inputs. Imagine those coming into one part of the factory. People assemble them. Workers engage in a transformative process to put all those things together, and the output is a car. And then there's a feedback loop, right, where we maybe have too many cars that are sold, so we need to now ramp up production, or too few that are sold, so the feedback loop tells us, hey, let's, let's you know, cut back on production a little bit, we don't need as many inputs, we don't need as many outputs, etc. So very, you know, the environment might be the, uh, the economic environment, the sales environment. So, so hopefully you see this idea of, you know, kind of inputs and outputs. And over time, people have um, uh, come up with different versions of systems theory models of organization. So, um, uh, what, where would we put, for example, um, how would we use systems theory to explain, for example, um, quality errors that are occurring in the manufacturing because people haven't been appropriately trained? Well, it would sort of exist in this big black box of transformative processes. Um, not quite sure exactly you know what that means so different people over time have taken this idea again that's been you know this this idea of systems theory as i said goes back to the you know 1960s and people have come up with different versions of this different models of how an organization functions as a as a lens on organizations one of those is the nadler tushman congruence model so the congruence model takes that same set of inputs processes outputs feedback and expands that quite a bit. So now we see that we see descriptions of what those environment you know, environmental inputs are, resources, history, the organization strategy, that now dictates what those transformation processes should be. And it tells us a little bit more about what's going on inside the organization. There's this linkage between um, the different tasks that happen, formal organizational arrangements like structures or processes on the right hand side there's this balance between informal practices maybe the kind of um, uh, kind of norms of how people work together and there's individuals individual skills and characteristics and so maybe now we can see more of what's happening inside this black box of the transformation processes and again it results in the outputs but now we have organizational outputs like cars and you know different big picture right revenue um, we have group outcomes so maybe the the um, results of a particular team now might be different and then we can look at the results of individuals so maybe the individual outputs could be individual skills they could be um, uh, job satisfaction of an individual it could be an output as well as an input you see some of these arrows going around here and again that same feedback loop so now we can start to to dive down a little bit more with this as a different kind of systems theory model. The key point of this particular model, the authors argue, and this goes back to about the early 1980s, is that um, the, this is a model of congruence or fit, meaning you know, if you want a certain set of outputs, all these different pieces inside have to fit together. Everything has to be pointed in the same direction. The individuals have to be trained for the task. Individual job descriptions have to go along with what the organization and its structures need. The informal organization of, you know, those those norms and those, you know, um, particular patterns of the informal ways that work gets done. All that has to be supportive of those tasks and individuals, etc. So um, the organization is successful if all of these things fit together. Another one is Marvin Weisbord's six box model. This one goes back to 1976, and he suggests very similarly to how we've seen in a couple of those other models of, of systems theory that um, you know an organization is really this blend of these different concepts. Um, there needs to be a clear purpose of the organization. What business are we in? What are we trying to do? A structure. How do we divide up the work? There need to be relationships among people and technologies that support the business's purpose and support the organizational structure. There need to be rewards and coordination that support the right kind of behavior and motivate employees. And the job of leadership is to keep all of these boxes in balance. And you see at the bottom this relationship between the organization and its environment. If the environment says um, is moving in one direction, right? Consumer preferences are pushing us to 
uh, buy a certain kind of cell phone or, or participate in a certain kind of uh, service plan because of some social or economic factors, whatever it is, um, the organization will have to respond in kind. The, a competitor comes out with a new product. Well, we need to do the same. So we might need to change our purpose. We might need to change our structure. And the job of leadership is to keep all of that in balance. Wiseboard also says about the six box model that each of these boxes has a formal component and an informal component. So there's a kind of informal structure in getting things done. There are formal rewards, probably like uh, compensation plans. There might be informal rewards of what people really get recognized for or what they get appreciated for. So this is, you know, again, another kind of example of systems theory. And hopefully you can see in all of these examples that systems theory um, really is that kind of, it's the relationship among these different components of an organization. And again, you probably have seen examples like this um, in your organization where um, maybe something is, has gone wrong or a problem occurs because of some upstream or downstream process impact on you. So um, in my job as an organization development consultant, I worked with a manufacturing organization at one time that was trying to control its costs. And what the way that they decided to, to control costs was by giving an incentive to the um, uh, kind of sourcing folks, the procurement folks, and the manufacturing folks to reduce inventory. So inventory is expensive. They would build up a lot of excess products that customers didn't need. They would end up paying for a lot of those raw materials, but never get money from customers because they would remain unsold in the warehouse. So. Um, they decided that they would compensate people and give them a bonus for reducing inventory levels. The downstream impact of that reduced inventory was that they cut so low in inventory that eventually more products were sold than were on hand to actually sell. There was a backlog. Customers were furious because they were waiting now weeks to get the products that they had ordered. So an, a, a change in one area, um, like the rewards and incentives um, to reduce costs, on the other hand, resulted in really some really unhappy customers and uh, decreased revenue as a result. Um, that eventually resulted in uh, a, a warning for revenues to Wall Street and the CEO leaving the company. So this is a pretty serious impact, but you could see how this systems theory idea, this reading of the organization of a change in one area affects changes in another area. Different components of the organization affect one another. This, this idea of systems theory really resonates with us because for most of us, it really explains um, the idea of, of, you know, it's sort of a, of a natural way of explaining how the organization works. For most of us, we get this idea intuitively. It offers us a place to look at changing and intervening if something in the organization isn't working well. We can divide up into the various process pieces or different components or chunks of the organization so that we can see that uh, we can see kind of an isolate, isolate where the problem is occurring among these different components of the organization. And it makes a lot of sense to us when we see these then upstream and downstream impacts. So for us in organizations, this idea resonates quite a bit. And it also explains what happens, for example, when um, an individual isn't successful in a job and that person leaves or gets terminated for whatever reason, they hire somebody else new, and the same person in the same job is also unsuccessful because the job was designed in a way that was impossible to begin with, maybe with a low budget or maybe other organizations that refuse to cooperate with that, with that goals, you know, with that person and his or her goals. So we now start to see that um, it, with systems theory, ah, maybe it's not just about individual people. We now start to see the broader interconnections among various components or pieces uh, and parts of the organization to see that things aren't just individual idiosyncrasies, but um, success of the organization or failure of an organization isn't just due to the you know, skills of a particular individual. It, it gets much more... Um, uh, much more broad and deep than that.
So, so systems theory has this kind of intuitive sense that people exist and live within these big structures of an organization and they um, perform the jobs that they're asked to perform within that kind of formal part of the organization. Now we turn to another approach that um, argues against that whole idea. And now, because if you start to think about it, what do we mean by, um, and, and, I, and I don't mean to get too philosophical here, but what do we really mean by an organization? What do we mean by the environment of an organization? These days, if you're, uh, if you're maybe a part-time contractor, you're an Uber driver, uh, you are um, uh, a, a, you know, as I say, kind of a temporary employee, maybe, you know, you, you own a business on um, eBay, um, maybe you provide a service to somebody. Um, are you a member of the organization Uber or eBay? What's the environment of the organization? What's, what's outside it? Um, is it easy to delineate a clear difference between insiders and outsiders in the organization? Sometimes there are long-term temporary, quote-unquote temporary employees of an organization who are just as much a member of a team as anybody else. Is it fair to say that they're not part of the organization and to draw a boundary around them? Um, or are they just as much a part of the team as anybody else? So the social construction folks say, look, this doesn't, this doesn't make any sense, that all of your boxes of you know, leadership and, and rewards and structure, that don't, those don't make any sense. Those aren't real things. The culture of an organization is not something real that we can point to. Um, what is leadership? In fact, aren't those things, aren't those concepts, not really objective concepts at all, but they only exist because people perform them, they enact them, they create them on an everyday basis. So the organizational culture is actually something that's, that's behaved, that comes out in how people talk to each other, how people interact with each other. Isn't the environment of the organization actually a construction of us talking about it to say, yep, this, this is what counts for me as being inside or outside the organization? Um, a scholar, Kenneth Benson, wrote, the, um, wrote about this and said, people are continually constructing the social world. Through their interac interactions with each other, social patterns are gradually built and eventually a set of institutional arrangements is established. Through continual interactions, the arrangements previously constructed are gradually modified or replaced. So a job description isn't anything until a person enacts the role, until someone performs the role. Um, titles don't really mean anything because they, they, people have to embody that role and actually enact it. Those titles might give certain decision authority to people, but isn't it the case that those that decision authority actually just becomes something because we've all agreed that that's how things will work? So it turns out that an organizational structure isn't really a thing at all. It's just something that we actually reproduce on an everyday basis because of how we act. How do we know that, that structure is, is working for us? It's because people are performing it on an everyday basis. So it's being created through interaction and communication. There's this great idea from Jeffrey Ford who wrote about the idea that organizational change is just a matter of a set of shifting conversations. Conversations that initiate change, that understand change, that perform change, and conversations for closure or, or ending or a cycle of change. So we can think of any of these ideas as simply a, uh, a social construction, something that we all kind of invent. And this resonates with us on a very practical level too, because in some cases, it's really freeing. It doesn't mean that the structure kind of dictates my behavior, but maybe it means that I have some choices, that organizational members take an active role in creating the organization. We can change our structure. We can change what titles mean. We can change the process. We can uh, develop new 
language, new stories, new kind of, you know, ongoing uh, changes to organizational life because all of these things were created in the very beginning. So you'll see this trend throughout the text that will that will keep looking at these concepts and ideas, but, um, you know, like the big picture, you know, environment, we'll look at power, we'll look at communication change, um, we'll look at organizational structures that are traditional, relational, network, culture, different types of structures, and we'll also look at uh, the opposite effect. How do we create these things? And when do we choose the choices that we make? So uh, the social construction approach gives us this freedom to make different choices. Those will be the two lenses that we'll use uh, throughout the course. We won't exactly talk to these in the, in the same way or using this this same language, but I hope this idea of the dual approach of top-down, bottom-up organization uh, helps you understand where we're headed throughout the course.